Georgia, 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 Georgia. everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Abadi and welcome to the third episode of All Eyes on Georgia um, as we are counting down the end of the year and counting down to January 5th when Georgia really gets to decide the fate of uh, the Senate and the ability of our government to function. And I am absolutely thrilled um, to welcome uh, Allison Mills Newman here today. Um, she has got um, an incredible background. She was an original cast member for the groundbreaking TV show, Julia, which um, in terms of representation was really the first black professional um, represented on television. Um, and she's also um, an accomplished author. She wrote a book uh, called Francisco. It was published by Ishmael Reed's publishing company. Um, Toni Morrison sung her praises. Um, Maggie Three is a more recent book she's written. And she's also directed, produced, and written a number of films, including Virgin Again and The Tree Widow. And if that's not enough, she's also the CEO of Keep the Faith Ministries. Um, and in that uh, mission, she serves as chaplain at the F Fulton County Jail, um, which encompasses Atlanta. Um, Allison, thank you so much for making the time. Um, I'm really curious about how you um, found that calling of, of um, working with prisoners in the uh, Fulton County Jail. So I, I think the thing about callings is that callings really find you. It's not something that you're looking for. <laughs> and um, it, 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 interrupts it comes into your life and interrupts your life and redirects your life so originally my idea when i was a little kid was um i wanted to be an actress um i i saw mia farrell on tv on pain face pa pain place long before your time and it was just such a beautiful story television many many years ago told lovely stories and much more palatable for young ears such as myself, 12 or 13 at that time. And I realized that what I had been doing when I was in the bathroom, like pretending to be another person or just looking in the mirror and making different faces and pretending to be an older lady or being in love or not being loved, just, you know, all those scenarios that I would pretend when I was a little girl, I was able to put the two together and realize, oh, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing, what these people are doing on television. And so my original desire wasn't based on being famous or being rich. I, I, I wasn't uh, worldly savvy to know that that could come along with it. It was just a uh, a, a desire, a, a, a passion that I had, something that I thought I could do and that I wanted to do at a very young age. And so I told my parents and my father was very adamantly against it because his concept of actresses were, were, were to use his word, were that they were whores. You know, they slept to get their fame and fortune with Loose different women, men. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but my mother, when she was in college, had been an actress and won awards. And so she was very supportive. She told my dad that she would watch over me. She would take care of me. She convinced my father. I would hear them like arguing at night over if I can or if I can't. But he, he, my dad decided that he would give me a chance. And, um, and he actually came along and began to support me too. And he, and, and and that was like really wonderful. So my mother found a workshop. And this is really important for history. The name of the workshop was the Theater of Being, and it was run by Frank Severa. And um, I was thirteen or twelve years old when I went. But my Angel and Kavit Kato and there were just a lot of people that got breakthroughs. Um, African-Americans got breakthroughs and 
became really successful. Uh, Nichelle Nichols from Star Trek, we were all in that class together. And they were adults and I was a kid. And um, so that was really amazing, Michael, for me to grow up around such brilliance and such beauty and, and such a love of art and such value for black people. And also at the time, uh, it was a, like a really pivotal time because it was during the time, of, for lack of a better word, the Black Revolution, Martin Luther King, Huey Newton, the Black Panthers. It was all this pretty much the, what almost is going on today, but I think it was a little, it was a little purer. It was a lot purer. Um, it wasn't co-opted in the beginning, at least by outside political forces. I didn't really know there was racism. I, I mean, I knew it, but I didn't know how it worked. So because I didn't know how it worked, I, I didn't have any ideas of limitations. You know, I knew it existed. I would hear my parents talking about it, but I didn't know really how it applied to me. But to make a, story, a long story short, um, I began to learn and there weren't a lot of roles that the, the African-Americans that you see on television today Wow, it's amazing because all we had then really was Amos and Andy. But um, with the Watts riots and the and the Black is Beautiful and Hollywood opened up, and thankfully, I was at the place where we had training, and I was prepared miraculously because what was I preparing for? I, there really weren't those many roles, but. But we all believed and we had this crazy idea that it would happen. And you guess what it did? And there were a series of different you know, auditions. Um, every audition, by the grace of God, um, I got. And I have to say, thanks be to God that I was talented, you know, his talent. And I was trained really well and, and was exposed to amazing people. So long story short, um, I became very successful. And I was a regular on Julia, which is a pioneering um, television, er, um, American television show, as well as an African American television show. It's pioneering. It's one. It's one of its kind. Breakthrough. I'm humbled to be a part of it. And um, I also became a regular on, a, on another television series uh, with Leslie Uggams, and I guest starred on so many television shows and Hollywood has a system where they pick and choose who they're going to make it to a star and i was a tv star but michael i had always wanted to be a, a movie star I, I grew up watching those beautiful classic old movies you know with betty davis and Mel oberon like withering heights was one of my favorite movies you know so i'm on i'm i'm famous i'm on the cover of magazines and um i get a meeting at universal studios i'm 19 years old my agent tells me um, that they've written a movie for me, just for me. And um, in fact, all the TV shows that I did were written just for me. It was an amazing, amazing time in my life. And so Michael, you know, they send a limousine, I go to Universal, I, everyone's like, ooh, and awe. you know, it's like you're a god, you're like an idol, you're <laughs> a celebrity. Madness is, is very empty. <laughs> Because they're ooing and eyeing as I'm going through the hallway to get to the producer's office, but inside I'm so dead and, and so empty and so lost. So anyway, um, get into the office with the gentleman and I'm 19 years old and he's about 60 at the time and he reminds me of my grandfather or something and he says, oh, we're going to make you into a star. They, they have their their image of, of what system they're going to fit you into and they were going to mm -hmm. fit me to this sex symbol because they compared me to Dorothy Dandridge and Marilyn Monroe but I had grown up wanting to be an actress wanting to do beautiful movies wanting to make the world a different place for all people and my people I wanted to do beautiful films that uplifted mankind right I had this idealistic crazy idea that didn't fit in Hollywood he goes in the bathroom Michael he comes out he has taken off all his clothes oh, that world exists huh it's real. Yeah, it's real. He took off all his clothes, this old, old man. And, you know, I'm 19, so the, I'm, I'm 69 now, but like 19, I'd never, that was like. The power dynamic and everything. Is I, was, I was devastated. And then I flashed back to my father, who had told me originally that he was leery of his daughter becoming Look an out actress. The, right. Because 
actresses were whores, were his words, I'm sorry to say, but that's what he said. And so in my youthful, I didn't mean it to be arrogance, but the way the perspective of Hollywood was that I was arrogant because I said to him, I'm an actress, I'm not a prostitute. And I don't know how I had the wisdom or the grace to say that at 19, but that's what I said. And he laughed at me and he said, you know, um, you want to be a star, you know, do this and that or whatever. And he said, you know, you'll never get anywhere. And I just left, you know, I just stormed out. They had sent a limousine. I caught a, caught a, ca a taxi home and I was devastated. That was a real heartbreaking time in my life because I wanted to make movies. I wanted to be a movie star. At that point, I wanted to be famous. I wanted to go on and make amazing movies. You know, I wanted to win the Academy Award to be the first <laughs> black actress to win the Academy. Amen. But you, but you encountered this life shattering experience. Went to um, my elders, my elders whose names I don't want to mention, but they're very, they were very famous and they were, they had TV shows and they were black. And so I went to them for advice and their advice was, oh, Allison, just do it. Sex is recreational, just do it. It's just a game, just this do it. The system works. Wow, yeah. so it, it was interesting because um, it's not that I was so moral, I mean, in terms as it relates to the Bible, I operated in fornication, sex before marriage, but that concept of just sleeping with someone for a role was very, I didn't understand, I couldn't wrap my mind around that. That was, that was prostitution. And that's, you know, I believed, I thought that sex and being intimate with someone in that way was because you loved them. And that's what it was for in my own sense of righteousness, that it had to do with love and caring about someone and not trading your body and your soul for success or for a role or to do something that you love to do, that you are qualified to do. You know, your qualifications and your gift should be enough to make room for you and to open the door and not to have to make like a pagan sacrifice to the gods of sex mm. to continue in your career. So that didn't help me any much at 18 and 19. And it was a type of situation where I didn't feel comfortable to talk to my parents. I had moved out of my parents' home anyway. And Hollywood Hills called Nichols Canyon. And my house was surrounded by bushes. And I, I was a member of the Automobile Club of America. So I called them to send someone to fix my car. Even though I was famous, I, I drove this like really humble little Volvo. I, I just wasn't into material things. The time, you know, like love, it was like a hippie kind of time. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, you know, I, I, I like the lowly, the, the lowly life, you know, I had the lowly life and the high life kind of mixed sure. together. So this old black man, and I say this because it's very distinctive. He was very, very black. He was as black as I don't know, as black. And his eyes shined so bright. And he looked so happy. And he looked so beautiful. And he looked so contented. And he drove an old raggedy truck. And he looked happy, even though I knew he wasn't famous. He didn't have wealth. Um, nobody knew his name. He was on the cover of magazines. How dare he be so happy? Like, how can he be so happy? He has none of the things that my mother's society, you know, all of my agents and everyone says is going to make me happy. He has none of it. He has none of that. I can look at him and tell. He's void of worldly gain and worldly prestige. And a lot of us actresses and actors, even though we can get on stage or behind cameras and be very bold, in real life we can be actually literally very shy. And so I was shy, and I, but I watched him with just awe and then I finally got my nerve up after he fixed my car and he drove down the hill in his raggedy truck and Michael mathematically by the time he got to the bushes 
and turned the corner. He should have still been there because he drove so slow. And I was young, 19. I ran down there. Poof, he was gone. And I heard a voice. And now that I'm so many years past, I know that it was God. I know it was Yahweh. I had an encounter with the Lord like Paul did on the road to Damascus. I heard the voice of God speak to me and call my name and say, Allison, there goes a real star. Huh. And I didn't understand intellectually, but I understood kind of emotionally or in, and spiritually, even though I didn't know I was understanding spiritually, I, I got it and I started to weep, you know, like I'm not a star. This old man, nobody knows his name, is a star to this voice in the universe. He's the true, he's the true star. And so I ran in the house, Michael, and the house, the whole wall was a window, like you could look out on the sky and the mountains. It was just beautiful, you know, in the Hollywood Hills. And I looked on the, the window and I saw a vision of, Mart, of, of Marilyn Monroe and, Daff, and Dorothy Dantridge dying. And those were the actresses. That was the box they put me in. Yeah. And so I understood, you know, I, I identified, I started screaming. Um, I had a roommate at the time. She wasn't famous. Her name is Cindy Williams. She went on to become a star of Laverne and Shirley. Sure. And um, I told, I asked her, do you see? And she didn't see it. She didn't see it. And, and I didn't take drugs. I didn't smoke marijuana. I didn't do cocaine, even though I was surrounded by it. I remember going to a Hollywood party and the whole table was filled with cocaine and I didn't even know what it was. And people were telling me to take some. And it was, just, I don't know, I didn't. Thank God I would have been on the cover of the front page in some newspaper somewhere, I OD'd and died because I could have taken so much thinking that it was candy or just food. I, uh, the ignorance and the irresponsibility that I was surrounded with in the midst of Hollywood, when I look back, was amazing. But the angels of the Lord were merciful to me. And, you know, I didn't do any of the cocaine, even though I didn't know what it was. But so I wasn't on drugs. It was a real vision from the Lord that I can say now, but I didn't know at the time that it was from the Lord. I didn't believe in God at the time. And so long story short, to try to reach up to where I am today, that began a journey of me leaving Hollywood and seeking for a safe place, seeking for my purpose and my destiny and wandering the earth. And I fell in love with his mercy and his grace, his kindness towards all human beings, all of his creation, and how we have so miserably disobeyed and turned against him and done our own thing and ruined so much of the earth, so much is corrupt, the food, the water, the trees, the, the schools, the churches. I mean, it's just endless how we in our flesh have continue to rebel against the Lord. But I came to a place of humility and gratitude for life and had lived enough, Michael, to realize that the riches of the earth and the fame of the earth that all the young people seek for in Instagram to be noticed and the attention is, is not satisfying. And the true satisfaction is having the attention when knowing that you have the attention of the creator and that being enough. The scripture does say his, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and the evil. So God sees us, you know, we're on his move. We're, we're living out his movie every day. And that's what we should be concerned about, you know, living a life, writing a movie, playing the role, if I may say that, that pleases him, that glorifies him, loving him, his spirit and loving one another which we are very miserable at not doing. <laughs> so um, out of that, um, I got a call. I did, I heard a call for me to preach the gospel, which was very interesting because women preachers are not accepted in churches, especially back then, I'm 69. So that was like when I was 27 and 30 and that was a rough road, but um, I did find avenues and opportunities and open doors that would allow me to minister the gospel. And I did marry a man that became a pastor um, and a preacher. So I got to serve side by side with him. And I had 
five beautiful children, all of whom are grown. My husband's gone on to be with the Lord. I was introduced to the South because one of my sons went to Morehouse. So I obeyed the Lord and I came to Atlanta and eventually I got involved in some of the churches and through that, um, I was able to um, become a chaplain um, in the Fulton County jails in the prison system, which was really interesting because someone said to me, how are you gonna go in and preach? You've never been in jail, you've never been in prison, you know, and on a certain level I've lived, in a secular way, I've lived a very privileged life. In a spiritual way, I've lived a very, a very privileged life. And I say that because anybody that God opens your eyes to see that he's real, that's a privilege because a lot of people don't see it. They don't see that he's real. And it's a privilege to have that awakening and to have that understanding and so, but I didn't let that intimidate me, Michael, and I went in and I, I was loved. I loved them and they loved me. And we're all in pain and we're all hurting and we're all broken in different ways. So universally humanity can identify. And so they, I'm, I'm humbled to say that um, they, they received me. I can identify with the brokenness because when, I was in Hollywood, I lived uh, the brokenness. Our people in the, in the jails and in the prisons um, are, suffer the same universal dilemma that I did, you know, whether you're rich or poor, black or white, we all have to come to terms with what is life really all about and the choices that we make and what do we value? Do we, you know, value the deception or are we, are we gonna try to get to the maze and find the truth? And some of the people in the prisons are able to find the truth in prison. It's a true story about, they call it jail, jailhouse conversions, but, and they, they mock it as if it's not real and as if it's, you know, fake and phony, but it's, I'm a witness that in the case where that's allowed for some people, some people that really, really happens and they genuinely, are changed by being shut down by God for a minute to think about their behavior and their choices and consider the possibility of making better choices. At the same time, there are many people in there, um, black of course, and also of all, of all nationalities, but the system is so wicked and unjust that there are many people in the prisons that are, they get lost, the judges, the lawyers, the attorney, Generalists, everybody forgets about them. You know, they have no money. It's like, you know, if you can't pay, you stay. Um, a lot of them have, are unjustly accused of crimes that they actually didn't commit. And then many of them may have committed a crime that was actually very minor and don't deserve to be in there for the time that they have been in there. And we see you know, in the, you know, in the news, so many people being released these days that have been in prison for 30 years for stealing, you know, a peanut, mm. you know, peanut butter. Mm. It's just such an evil, wicked system. So we have to stay awake. We have to stay alive. We have to stay compassionate and concerned and, and speak to the elite powers that be that have forgotten what it is to be human and what it, have forgotten what it means to serve and be in power, to be in power to, 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 to make the world a better place and not to, um, and, and not for personal gain and not for greed, which is the days and the time we're living in. We're living in a time of greed where, and boasting and self-promoting, um, where so many of our leaders, spiritual, Christian, as well as political, have teamed up together to really uh, create a deceptive um, environment where the lie is trying to appear as the truth. And so many people are believing the lies that unfortunately the media also feeds. And society is, you know, believing. I'm, I'm really grateful to be safe because the word of God is true. And I can somehow through that make a maze through all of that and see 
the false prophets, like Jesus talked about the false prophets that would be so many in these, in, in these last days. And he talked about knowing a true believer in God and his love by their fruits. You know, you know someone who's truly a, a Christian or walking with the Lord by their fruit. And we're living in a day and a time when they're, they call the religious right, the religious right, but they're really the religious wrong. And they operate in illegalism, exploiting the Bible, exploiting Jesus, exploiting their false sense of self, you know, this sense of self-righteousness, this sense of really racial superiority wrapped up into their white wing wrongness, religionist, false prophet, love of money and love of power, which is so contrary to the humility right. and the love and the compassion of King Jesus. So um so you you really yes. laid out you really laid out a lot there you you you've painted a picture of 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 a corrupt system and a broken culture yeah. and and on top of this year of 2020 being a year of incredible suffering um with the virus and the amount of isolation it's caused and disconnection yes. it's caused um and you're you're there's this central tension of a as a believer, how much do you engage in this corrupt world? You're reminding me that there was a time when many Christians would, would not engage in politics. Um, and that, that really shifted probably 70s or 80s. Yes. Um, that, I, I just wonder how you, you, you kind of struggle with dipping your toe in that corrupt world to change it versus... Um, you know, pulling back and remaining in a pure place. That seems to be just a, a central struggle. And then you've, you've got, you know, Reverend Warnock deciding to full on, you know, put, put himself into the political world. Um, I do think having been in Hollywood, you know, I, I do think that it's so easy to start out with a humble heart and then and 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 to keep it but but to maintain that as you succeed and you're showered with it you know acclamations and wealth and you're living in mansions and you're separated from the people that was the amazing example of christ though he was god he humbled himself and born in a manger he was not born in a mansion <laughs> and there is specific reasons, I, I believe, detailed reasons why these choices were made to teach us, to show us that all that glitters is in gold and, and that this lust for the pride of life to be known and to be famous and to have power can, can, steal, can steal the original motivation and the original heartfelt um, desire to be a voice for those that are in need on the earth. And so my prayer is that politicians that start out with that type of um, desire in their heart, that they're able to maintain it. And I think it's really difficult because they're already bought. It takes, to be a senator, it's like you get paid like 175,000 or something like that, 200,000 maybe, right? It costs millions. Yeah, it costs millions right. to run for office. So where are you going to get this money? Like, where are you? Like, you start out poor, but they say, okay, they pick you. Like, they picked me, right, to be a movie star. <laughs> so how are you gonna like? How are you gonna wade through all of that and not become a slave? Even though you have all these good intentions originally, but how are you gonna maintain your integrity and your original, you know, purpose and goal? to make a change and support all people and not buy into the global elite and the, and the, and, 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 and the powers that be that, that don't care. That's really difficult because you owe them. You owe them. You know, I wish, um, you know, I wish them well and I hope that they're able to stay. I hope that they're able to stay within You know, the world of living that simple life and caring about simple everyday people, all people as well, but 
you know, the simple life, the people that are in prison, the, the you know, the racism. I do want to say that, you know, as an African-American, it, it really is traumatic. <laughs> it's traumatic. I remember, Michael, when I was famous and I drove home, my parents moved into a, um, at the time, they called it an all-white neighborhood. They were the first white people. It used to be a big deal back in the 60s, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember I was in my little Volvo, and um, I drove to my parents' house to visit them. I think I was 19. A lot of very pitiful things happened to me when I was 19. And I remember getting out of the car, and all of a sudden, there were two policemen behind me. And I imagine, I'm a 19-year-old female. Two policemen. One has a gun, points it to the back of my head, and pulls the trigger. Imagine. And he says, what are you doing in this neighborhood? Mm. <gasps> you know, and my parents had taught, like all African-American parents taught us, you know, be humble. I was, you know, stay cool. And so, you know, I said as humbly and meekly and quietly as I could, you know, the gun is cocked at the back of my head. My parents live here. And they didn't believe me at first. They thought it was crazy. But then one of the policemen recognized me from television mm. and recognized that I was a famous actress. And so it made sense that possibly I wasn't lying. And my, I, it, it's possible that my parents might be able to afford to live in this neighborhood because you know I was a TV star. And they pulled, you know, they retrieved their gun. Do you know, Michael, that I got myself together? I went in the house. You know, I never told my parents. Hmm. Do you know I never told anyone? Do you know I never spoke about it for like maybe 30 years? Nobody would believe you. The amazing and the beautiful thing, everything pretty much is the same and almost worse, but the amazing thing today is that we have cell phones. Back then, right? Oh, you, we, the, that you can see that we're not paranoid. <laughs> This is real life. I remember my husband, um, he was a tall, very tall black guy, like a gentle giant, but that tallness can be intimidating. And I remember he, he ran a, a red light, Michael, and um, he was such a nice soul, grew up in Berkeley. So he had that kind of like love everybody mentality and his spirit in his experience as a young boy. And you know, grew up around white people, you know, Asians, you know, black people, Mexicans, everybody in that Berkeley, San Francisco kind of environment. So he, he loved people as people and police. So he, he, he read a red light. Okay. So we understand that. And we, and he pulled over to the side. And usually if you run a red light, you just, they give you a ticket, you know, and you go and you deal with it. They pulled a gun on him. They threatened to kill him right there. Me sitting beside him. I mean, by the grace of God. By the grace of God. Allison. And then I remember after he passed away, um, I was driving. I had a church in the inner city in Los Angeles. And... Um, my husband, before he passed away, he bought me an old BMW, black, I don't know, magnificent woman or something like that. So I had this BMW and driving to what society would call the black ghetto or whatever. And please stop me, Michael. I pull over. I haven't done anything. I pull over. The guy, the, the police looks, you know, I rolled down the window. He looks at the window and he says, I smell marijuana. It's <laughs> a classic line. I was like, oh, my God, you know, and he said, you know, pop the trunk. So I popped the trunk and suddenly he changed. He pulled the, put the trunk down. He came back pleasantly and uh, gave, gave me my ID back and, you know, let me go. So the Lord heard my prayer. But I have four black sons and I can tell you that when they're little babies, they're cute to everybody. But when they become teenagers, a transformation takes place and you just know that you have to pray and raise your sons to be very strategic when they become teenagers and start driving cars so they can survive you know mm -hmm. 
but um, when my teenager, teenage sons did start driving cars in California, in Los Angeles, before they left the door, before they walked out the door, my husband and I would pray and ask God to protect them, literally from the police. <laughs> Dear Father, in the name of Jesus, please protect my son from the police. Bring him home safe. Imagine. And so I want to share that to say that a lot of people of color, specifically black men, um, are in prison simply because of the fear of black men. Right. Right. The fear of black people. I've, um, um, I, you're really leading me to ask you, um, you've, you've, indicated there's a, a, a strain of Christianity that's kind of, you call it the, the Christian wrong, the Christian right, that's wrapped up with white supremacy. And I'm, I'm wondering when you encounter someone of that ilk, how you engage them, how is, from Christian to Christian, how does that conversation work? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, I, I don't, it's a mystery and a minefield to me when I think about it. I don't, I don't know how those, two versions of Christianity come well, together yes, or could it's possibly. Very, it's interesting. That's a, a great, deep, wide open question because there's many layers in, in my humble estimation. There's an acknowledgement. You have to acknowledge that you are racist. You have to acknowledge that you've lived your life deceived. And that takes a lot. That a lot of people don't have that ability. And then I do think it's a generational curse. I do think this spirit of racism follows. Um, it follows and you grow up in it innocently. You're taught it um, in, 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 in the Christian environment. And it's just part of, it's part of the seed that's planted in you. And so it takes a real awakening, a real breakthrough, a real humility to see it and to accept it because in some of my conversations I, with, with, with some of my white friends, it's offensive, like you're attacking them. And we're not, I'm not trying to attack anyone by telling you the reality of what we live as a people. There you are. I, you know, I am for changing some of these laws that put people in jail and put people in prison um, for minor, for minor so-called crimes. You know, I, you know, I don't think, people that sell drugs should be in jail, you know? I, I don't think women that have been in domestic abuse situations should be in jail. Um, one of the instances that I experienced in prison was a woman, she was a teacher, and uh, one of her students' parents came up to the school and um, got in an argument with her, and I guess it got volatile and loud, and the principal called the police and the principal took the two women to jail for arguing and they were black. Mm -hmm. Now two white people can argue they're not going to jail, but the, the but the policeman put the, the teacher in jail. She lost her job. She lost her home. She was still in jail for a, a couple of years for this incident. This is, this is oppression. This is oppression. So you try to share this with some white people. They feel defensive and they take it personal. But I would try to encourage white people, don't take it personal. Look at it as a spiritual warfare, as good versus evil. And, and that racism is a spirit that you can denounce and deny and reject and denounce. And you don't have to accept it. When that little voice comes and says, oh, you're better than him, or, you know, he shouldn't have that job, or he's not good enough, or, you know, he's less than you. When that little voice comes, that little spiritual evil voice comes, you have the power to acknowledge it and to deny it. And you have the power to stand up for righteousness and stand up for love, which was very beautiful when um, George Floyd died for me to see so many beautiful white people, young white people who were free of that defensive, protective, you know, that's not me, wall. Right. <laughs> that wall was gone. That was so right. gorgeous to see. Right. And, and they embraced our pain as, as human pain. 
without defense. Do you, so, do you have do you have faith that uh, an unequal and unjust like a, a massive structure like a justice system? Do you have faith that can be you know reformed in this life on this earth, or is this is is this just you know the wicked world that we live in? I don't think it's really going to be ushered in. The world, according to the word of God, is going to get wickeder and wickeder more and more violent the bible talks about how in the days of noah so will it be so we, we stand for goodness and that we make those changes and those imprints where we can and god is there to help them no matter how oppressive society is and no matter how difficult um, society tries to make it be that you can make it that god can work it out and people that are in politics you know teachers i would hope that wherever a christian is placed in whatever environment um, whatever arena that within that arena that they would let their light shine and be a light and make make a change um, you know side with love um, I think the 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 religious wrong they really exploit things that are true to Christianity that deceive people to buy into voting for them because they have this pretense of presenting themselves um, as Christian but it's really legalism and it's really self-righteousness, which Jesus, Yeshua hated. He called them hypocrites, vipers. Right. And so we want to hold religious right or wrong um, accountable and speak to their hearts, speak to them. If they really believe in Jesus, I would, I would like to hope and believe that they can be transformed, they can be touched too. But it's kind of hard because they seem really stuck on their power and really stuck on their whiteness and really stuck on their divis divisiveness and dividing people. Right. It's like a mental in the death. name of Jesus. Yeah. In the Some name of Jesus. So somehow. Somehow. But yeah, and everyone, but everyone do what you know, everyone change one. And so I do believe that. I have to have faith. I have faith. I know God has used me to change lives. I know my life has been changed by people that poured into my life and spoke to me and helped me and, and so if we can all just one by one pour into each other love and encouragement and help one another um and come out of being defensive um let the walls come down and open up our hearts and listen to one another i think that's one of the beautiful things the word of god teaches me is listening and i'm always so grateful when uh, you know, white people listen, but I do want to say that growing up in Hollywood, and that's the confusion, growing up in Hollywood, I had a lot of white friends who really listened, that, that artistic, that creative mm -hmm. energy, and that insight that artists have opened us up. Um, yeah. No listen to other people, yeah. To understand other people's feelings and where, you know, their cultures and where they're coming from, that love of creativity. Like you look at a person, and you see their blue eyes and their and their and their blonde hair is beautiful. You look at a person, you see their slanted eyes, and that's so beautiful, so artistic. You know, you look at a, a black man shining in his blackness, and it's gorgeous. You know, because you see it through the eyes of creation and through the eyes of creativity. So I think yeah, I, I, I think I, white people that have grown up in that type of environment are are free of the defensiveness and they can listen, but. The, re the Republican wrong, are, are, they grow up in a mindset of they're right and everyone else is wrong. And no one else is worthy. It's like they look down. It's like, you know. It's heavy judgment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, you, 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 you're poor because you deserve to be poor, you know, because you're stupid and you're right. ignorant. And I'm wealthy. You're because not, you I'm know, wealthy. my husband. My husband had a, a, a degree from Stanford University, Michael. Imagine, highly educated. He went and applied for a job. Um, he had to take a test. And he, was, he had that kind of genius mind. He was really good at tests. I have a creative mind. I do not do well at tests. But he aced that test. He scored the highest test, the highest on that test. And the employers didn't know he was black right they had the audacity this is the the arrogance of white supremacy that sickness that disease that demon it's a demon 
that you don't that people don't have to embrace that you can acknowledge it and denounce it a demon but, can be exercised yes it yes it's not a permanence it's Definitely. not permanent um Alison, so they told him i just want to finish this story they said to him to sure. his face a grown black man they said you don't look intelligent enough to have gone into stanford just to say that out loud how did you get into stanford that shows you the blindness of yeah. this racism yeah and then they and then they didn't believe that he took the test they they accused him of cheating on the test <laughs> like how could he score that high on the test when he's black so that's inbred that's generational that's like a curse that's a curse to think that way right and i think people that have been raised or think that way I hope that somehow they can see that it's a curse and not want to live out a life of curse and repent and see that we're all beautiful, we're all brilliant in our different ways and we're all created by God and we all have different gifts and talents to bring to the table and we don't have to be jealous and we don't have to hold other people back. There's enough for everybody, there's enough room for everybody, there's enough prosperity for everyone. Do you, do you consider voting like an, an act of love? Voting is very challenging for me. My, my, my identity is in Christ, period. However, I have relatives that died. Um, my, uncle, my, my uncle's house was bombed in Mississippi because he was helping people vote in the 60s. So I recognize the value and the importance in that yeah. many people white people and black people in the 60s died, you know, for me to be able to vote. So I'll just say it's very, very challenging. It's very challenging. And, but I did vote. <laughs> you asked me in the email if I voted and I did vote. Um, this particular Senate vote situation is, n is not as challenging as some other situations have been. There's a lot that I don't agree with Ossoff and um, Warnock as it relates to the word of God, but I, I see their motivation in their heart. Uh -huh. And the motivation of their heart is love. I don't see the motivation of Purdue and the other lady, the lady is more about power and maintaining the Republican power. Not, I don't see the heart to really help people and strengthen people and build people. So right. I based my vote based on what I, what I hear, what I hope I'm hearing. And I hope, like I said, that they stay true. They stay true to the mission, right. which is and, hard and in that not, environment. It's not necessarily a laundry list of, of policy positions, but you really try to take the measure of their heart and vote accordingly. That's what I did in this case, yeah. In this case, um, I take it case by case. You know, right. I, I take the political arena and its presentation to me case by case, you know, and I listen to the heart. I try to look at their past, although I understand people can change. I'm a big believer in people changing. And they may have made choices and voted for things in the past that were abominable but maybe you know they've learned and they were caught up so it's challenging yes it's challenging yes it's challenging you know? but ultimately you come down on the need to in, the need to engage yeah and i think it's about the people it's about helping people you know all this the things that the the republicans try to exploit with the same-sex marriage and the um abortion um, Those are the two big. That's a personal individual, in my case, because I believe in the word of God's sin that we take before the Lord um, ourselves, and so you know I I deal with that, and I um, um, you know I I deal with that area, and I approach that area. I don't think that area is an area that politicians should use to exploit to get a vote. A vote, right. although I do think it's important, but they're not sincere. It is not genuine, right? And because a because they're homosexuals too, and they're you know like you you read in the paper, you read you know someone was caught with a, you know a man was caught with a man, and they voted 
they voted against uh, same sex or they voted for it. I mean, it's yeah. just, yeah. it's just madness. Yeah. It's well, chaotic it's, madness. It's insanity. And it's, so there's some judgment and hypocrisy at root there. Yeah. And it's such an evil game. So politics is challenging. I try to, I, I really try to keep my heart out of it um, because I think it, it really taints. It, it, if you get really into it in the way that some people are, that they'll kill you based on who you voted for yeah. and who you did vote for. And politics certainly does not nourish the soul. It is it is yeah. a slog yeah. and a drain, and and it's um and it's a world of compromise. And so, as a as a um, as a preacher, as a person called to God, um, I'm called. I can't compromise the word of God. You know, I can't compromise. But politicians, you have to compromise, or at least that's what they say. And so. It you're really, really, you're really reminding me right now of the controversy of um, Warnock having um, from the pulpit saying you can't serve two masters and Leffler using, using that um, to attack him, saying he's anti-police, saying he's anti-military. Um, that, that idea of, of you know, if you if you only serve one master, then how can you even? Um, well, first of all, that's a lie because all the preachers in Georgia, we all work with the police. You know, I'm not I'm not talking about one arc, but one arc. Um, what he says makes sense. He 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 wants to reform the police. He wants the police to do right. He wants, like all of us, you don't want white supremacists and people that go into the police on purpose to kill black people. Right, right. To be a policeman, you want An people arm, that right. you know have sound minds and understand and you know operate with uh, caution, but also with love for everybody and aren't racist and aren't looking down on the poor people of all color or whatever the madness that goes on with the police where they protect each other they lie with each other you know i i work with police i'm a chaplain i go into the the prisons you know i deal with police and there are a lot of good police right um, uh, but obviously there are a lot of bad police so i think there's balance and i think um purdue and the late the other lady they incite imbalance they incite this extreme um image of one that you know isn't true because there's no preacher in georgia that is not working with the police side by side and you know trying to make atlanta a safer place um you know for everyone <clears throat> and for policemen should be held accountable just like a teacher should be held accountable or a preacher or, or someone that takes vibes you know if you whatever arena that you're in and they they base their politics on fear and scaring people to death of each other <laughs> so and those politics of fear have been working you know really well in the last few years and i i i hope we've turned a corner and those those tactics won't work anymore or at least not as well as they have um Allison, well, they we work they seem to work pretty much with the with that with the base that um supports the republicans um they and it's not new they've been doing this since the beginning of america or maybe sure. even before but even when i was a kid just the fear just the fear of black people or the fear of foreigners, the fear of poor people, you know, right. just this spirit of fear, which Purdue and the lady should understand the scripture says, for God is, has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love and a sound mind. And the fact that they put their Christianity on the, on the side to, to breathe and to plant seeds of fear versus planting seeds of love. You know them by their fruits. That's religious wrong. That's not religious right. Allison, that's a really nice, nice place to leave us. Um, you've you've really gone deep here and 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 helped us move move beyond I don't the day to day horse race of politics. So 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 thank you very much. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. I I um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to. 
just talk about these days and times that we're living in yeah. and the chaos of it all. But I do monumental. I do want to tell everyone that may be listening to that don't be afraid and don't walk in fear. Walk in love, walk in grace, keep love, keep love alive, keep faith alive. Georgia, 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 Georgia. Georgia.